Welcome to the second part of our discussion of the Roman Empire. We left off at the very end of Republican Rome, and you recall that Julius Caesar, the consul who'd been elected consul but declared himself dictator, was assassinated in 44 BCE. <clears throat> There was a long struggle for power among various figures. I won't get into the details here. And finally, there was the famous Battle of Actium in the Eastern Mediterranean, in which the generals Octavian and Mark Anthony had a major battle. And Mark Anthony, of course, was the lover of Cleopatra. Um, and when Mark Anthony lost, that was the end, in essence, of Cleopatra, and she later committed suicide. There's a, a video in the module that explains this. This is the stuff of legend. The beautiful Cleopatra, who had attracted Mark Anthony. Cleopatra had thought that Mark Anthony would be replacing Caesar as the... Uh, head of the Roman Empire, but uh, she lost out here. By the way, so Octavian became the head of the Roman Empire, and now he inaugurated himself as Augustus. He changed his name, and Augustus in Latin means the illustrious one, and that was 27 BCE. Now that marks the official end of the Republican period, and the beginning of Imperial Rome, which lasts <clears throat> almost uh, 500 years. Like Republican Rome, it was a vast multicultural empire. It expanded even more. The emperor now was a total dictator. He, his personal staff, his civil service and army controlled everything. And he assumed the title of Principe, which in Latin means first among equals. And so some people refer to this period of time as either the empire or the principia. Now public buildings were built not just for administrative reasons, courts and whatnot, but for the glory of leaders. And this now, the next 200 years, are the so-called Pax Romana, which in Latin means Roman peace, and this led to gold, Rome's golden age. And this is despite, unfortunately, the end of democracy. There was peace throughout the Roman Empire, relative security, and great wealth. <clears throat> now, Augustus and subsequent emperors had to justify ending democracy and they needed public support. So what happened is the emperors and the wealthy people, the patricians, they set up a so-called commonwealth of patricians and the public. So the patricians more or less convinced the public that they and the emperor were acting in the public faith. And this is the first time we see this explicitly come out in world history, where they are seeking the support of the public for their rule. They built many public works to benefit the people. These were the baths, the public baths, large baths throughout the Roman Empire. And they were more than just going in and having a bath. People could spend a lot of time there. And throughout much of the Roman Empire, they had very, very cold winters, including in Rome itself for several months. People could go in, it was free. They got free food and wine, beautiful marble statues. And people of all classes mixed. The genders were separate, but you could be relatively poor and you could be just a few feet away from a noble per person. They also constructed the aqueducts to bring fresh water to people throughout the empire. We'll look a little more at the construction of the aqueducts um, later in this lecture. Uh, as I mentioned last lecture, the Colosseums were built, the amphitheaters throughout the empire from England to Turkey to, to Egypt, throughout the empire, 
uh, free admission for the gladiator matches, which, and we'll talk more about those in a few minutes, which were wildly popular. And they also build huge stadiums for the chariot races. So they're providing many benefits to the people. And in the Colosseums or the amphitheaters, they also, uh, the patricians would throw balls or they'd have people throw balls out to the public and these balls had numbers on them and the people could go to uh, the back of the stadium and they could get prizes, everything from money, land even, apartments. And during all of these events, the people receive food and wine. Now the Romans thought they really had it well, particularly the patricians, the, the wealthy classes, and they said, how have we become so great? How do we become the greatest empire in the world? And they, their view of history was static. They thought that this empire would last forever, that they had reached perfection. And what we're gonna see is the most significant literature and art in the Roman area was produced during the dictatorships of Augustus and following emperors for about 150 years. <clears throat> in literature, I'll just mention the, by far the most famous work, and this is the founding story of Rome. It was written by Virgil, and it's called the Aeneid. Actually, Augustus asked Virgil to write this story, uh, and the theme is the dignity of Rome's past, and this is the national epic for Rome, much like the Greeks had Homer's Iliad and Odyssey that we talked about earlier in the course. And the, the theme of the Aeneid is personal responsibility and the nature of human destiny. Uh, this is just a copy of part of it. Obviously it's written in Latin. And this is a famous phrase from book two um, if you've studied Latin, you would, of course, study this section of, of the work. And it translates as how difficult it was to found the Roman people. It was difficult, in other words, to bring all these tribes together in Italy and uh, form the Roman Empire. And it's not boostery saying, oh, we're number one, number one. It said, no, we've had to work and we'll continue to work for this empire. Oops. The, the theme of it is the, Ro the Trojan prince uh, goes to Troy, excuse me, the prince from Greece goes to Troy, rescues uh, no, excuse me, the Trojan prince, sorry, uh, Aeneas flees Troy. You'll recall that it was destroyed by the Greeks and he goes through the Mediterranean and he founds the new city of Rome. And this is similar to Augustus reviving the glory of Rome after decades of civil war, after the death of assassination of Julius Caesar. Now, Augustus traced his ancestry to Aeneas. Okay, so Augustus is now emperor. He's a dictator. And he said, well, I'm a relative of Aeneas, who was our founding father. And the Aeneas represents really the traditional values of Rome. It's a holy journey by Aeneas to a better place. And he did it not just to become wealthy, but for the future of all Romans. And so Aeneas represents fundamental Roman virtues. And I've written four here, seriousness. These are serious people. That's the word gravitas. And you, we use the word grave in English. If someone is, has a grave illness, that's a serious illness. Duty and devotion to others. That's piety in English. Self-control. That's where we get the word uh, dignitas is dignity in English. It means someone has self-control and courage at all times. Virtuous in Latin or virtue in English. And, and what this means if you look at those, think back of our discussion in the last lecture of the most popular philosophy in Rome. And what was that? Stoicism. 
these are values of stoicism. You're, you're serious, self-control, you're courageous. Okay. In terms of art, frescoes were very popular. Frescoes are wall paintings, and particularly a fresco refers to painting small sections of the wall. They put a plaster on. When the plaster is still wet, it's painted, and so the paint soaks into the plaster, and so when it dries, it has a different coloring effect, and it's also more permanent. And many of the Roman um, paintings glorify nature and agriculture, and many, many of the best preserved were, fa were found at Pompeii. They'd been covered in ash, but the ash wasn't so hot that it you know, actually melted the, the painting. And they, we talked about this in the introduction when we looked at analyzing artwork. We have some good examples. We'll show one here in a minute. How they used linear and atmospheric perspective to show depth on a two-dimensional surface. This is a, a Roman dining room. And the way that people dined then, they didn't sit in tables and chairs like we do nowadays. Along the edges of this room, they had couches, so people would, the wealthy people would uh, lay down on one side and servants would bring in the food and they'd be there and have long meals and talk and whatnot. Now, look at, we're going to focus on the back wall to look at perspective here, the three dimensional illusion. Okay, here we can see, let's focus first on the white wall. You see in the middle, it looks like the white wall goes back in the distance, doesn't it? Well, they achieve that by, you can see that's where it goes back at an angle. And if you were to get out a ruler, you could see that the wall behind the tree is slightly, slightly shorter than the wall in front of the tree. And it gives the optical illusion of depth. Of course, there's no depth here. This is painted on a flat wall. Now, that's linear perspective. Atmospheric perspective, you can see quite clearly in the trees. You look at the tree in the center. You can see a few individual leaves. Some of it's blurred, but a few. You look at the trees on the right and left, you can see some fruit or flowers and individual leaves. But look a little further back, and what do you see? You just see green blur, and that gives the optical illusion of depth. Now they had statues to honor the emperor and other leaders. Now Augustus, of course, connected himself to Aeneas, and he was a famous statue of him, Augustus of Prima Porta. Prima Porta means the main entrance. So with the main entrance of Rome, that road, uh, Augustus had a statue of him put up. And what he wants to do is he wants to convince people that uh, Aeneas, who is his forefront, his ancestor, he claims, was the child of the goddess Venus, just like Cupid was. And here you can see this famous statue, Augustus of Primera Porta, and you can see uh, Cupid on the lower left. I think we all know Cupid from Valentine's Day where cute little Cupid has a little bow and arrow and is shooting arrows of love. But Cupid was believed to be the child of the goddess Venus. So what we have here is Augustus with his little sister, uh, Cupid. We all can focus on this for a moment. Look at that dynamic monument. He's stepping forward. He's taking some sort of action. He's ho holding his clothing over the arm. He has on very, very elaborately sculptured uh, armor. His hand pointing forward. He, he wants to portray himself as a real leader. <clears throat> now let's look briefly at gladiators. And you've all heard of gladiators, probably seen them portrayed in, in various movies. Be sure to watch the video that discusses the evolution of gladiators. Um, there'll be more one or two quiz and exam questions on this. 
As I mentioned when we discussed the Etruscans, they had two men fight over a fresh grave with the idea of drawing blood so some blood would drip down onto the grave. So it was a religious ritual. Then it evolved. During the Republic, the later years of the Republic, there was this, the gladiators were now a symbolic battle, not for, with Romans with their enemies, but rather among Rome's traditional enemies. And as the video quite clearly shows, you'd take uh, tribes that everybody knew were Rome's traditional enemies that they conquered, and they'd have the gladiators put on the helmet and the weapons of those enemies. And you'd have two gladiators, both of them representing Rome's traditional enemies, the same group, and they would fight. So that was a symbolic battle. But then during the empire, the imperial uh, period, or in the movie, the professor calls it the Principe, which means Imperial Rome. Then it evolved into what most of us probably thought gladiators were. It's public entertainment. It's like professional football or baseball, provided by the generosity of the emperors throughout the empire. There was only really one sport in, in spectator sport in Rome, and that was gladiatorial matches. Um, they did have chariots, but by far the main one were, was the gladiatorial matches. They had amphitheaters or coliseum built throughout the empire. And we'll see in a minute when we look at Pompeii, they had a large amphitheater there. Throughout the empire, people went and the central government um, had the, the amphitheaters built. There was a whole system of, of training gladiators. And the way it normally worked was in the morning, <clears throat> they would have the gladiators fighting animals, and these were exotic animals, and the more exotic, the better. They had elephants on occasion. They had ostriches. If you've ever seen a real ostrich, they're huge, and they're very, very dangerous. Their kick can easily kill a human. Uh, they had, on one or two occasions, even brought rhinoceri, rhinoceros. They had tigers, whatever. Then at lunchtime, sort of middle of the day, they had the execution of criminals. And this is when, on occasion, uh, Christians were marched out and told, uh, you know, that they would be eaten, literally eaten by uh, lions if they didn't renounce uh, Christianity and accept the Roman gods. And they would kneel down and pray and sing and the spectators were, were horrified. They thought, what kind of people are these? What kind of religion do they have where they're not, they're, they're dying, they're martyrs. Uh, and we'll talk more about this in Christianity. So actually the death of these uh, Christians sort of backfired because it led to many people asking about Christianity. The gladiators were the superstars of the time. It was really the only spectator sport. The chariots were uh, driven by slaves, but the gladiators were given freedom of successful. Most of them were slaves, but some free people volunteered to be gladiators. In fact, they were so popular that Roman brides took the hair from gladiators and they and they smeared, excuse me, the blood from gladiators smeared it in their hair, and that was supposed to make them more fertile with strong children. Uh, about 90% of the time, both gladiators lived, so they didn't always fight to the death. Why? It was very expensive to train gladiators, and then they were purchased and sold. Um, they had almost contracts, like uh, modern professional athletes, and near all the amphitheaters, and most of them are no longer existing. There, there were gladiator schools. Wealthy people would purchase gladiators, train them, <clears throat> and then, um, and that was very, very expensive. Um, they gave them the best diet possible. And so they didn't really want their gladiators 
to go out and you know half the time on average die. Now traditionally most people thought you know the emperor would put thumbs up to mean that the gladiator lives, the one who's on the ground, and thumbs down meant kill him. Well, recently there's been a lot of analysis of Roman artwork, particularly mosaics of gladiators, and it has shown just the opposite. When the emperor gave thumbs up, the, the thumb up meant that the victor must raise, the winning gladiator must raise his sword and let the fallen gladiator live. Thumbs down meant that the victor would raise his sword and then bring it down to kill the fallen uh, opponent. Now, Pompey, oh, sorry, uh, the gladiators, as I already mentioned in the morning, fought exa exotic animals, then they had executions, and then the afternoons they had the battles, and again, the video explains in detail how they had judges there. They had very detailed rules. The gladiators had different types of weapons. One gladiator might have a net and a short sword. The other one may have and, and very little armor and had to dance around quickly. The other one had a big shield with a, a big helmet, couldn't see very well. And so they were balanced to give the best possible fight. <clears throat> Pompeii, we've already discussed some. Um, it's located south of Rome, a couple of hours drive near the major city of Pompeii, of uh, Naples. And in the year 79 CE, Mount Vesuvius volcano, which is just above it, erupted. Now it's interesting, Pompeii had become a quite popular destination for wealthy Romans for holidays. And part of it was the excellent wine because Mount Vesuvius had erupted uh, many times in the distant past and therefore the soil was particularly fertile and produced wonderful grapes uh, and wonderful wines. Uh, be sure and watch the videos on uh, Pompeii. Well, it, what's interesting is the Roman god Vulcan, from which we get the word in English volcano, was the god of fire. And the god Vulcan was considered a very important god because the people needed, the people needed um, fire, obviously, to cook and for heat. But he was also feared because of the building fires I talked about before in the apartment buildings, um, which were largely made of wood. <clears throat> now, it's an interesting coincidence that every year they had a festival for Vulcan in which sacrifices were made. And that annual festival for the god Vulcan was the night before the major Mount Vesuvius eruption. So when Mount Vesuvius started erupting the next day, people thought, well, Vulcan, the god Vulcan is not happy, didn't think that our, our sacrifices were sufficient. <clears throat> also, as is normally the case, uh, the volcanic eruption was preceded by several weeks of earthquakes. Uh, and those earthquakes, obviously, with their scientific knowledge was, were not viewed as a precursor to a volcanic eruption. But people thought, oh, the gods were angry at us, angry at us, because Pompeii was known for its very loose morals, and it had many, many exotic prostitutes from all around the empire. And that was one reason some many of the wealthy Romans went there, um, not just for the wine, but all the exotic prostitutes. And so... Now, Pompeii was covered with ash. People knew it had existed because not everybody was killed. People had escaped and written about it. And the excavations began about 250 years ago, <coughs> started by the French. And we have wonderful, wonderful examples of daily life there. Uh, it's interesting that about a third of Pompeii has been left covered with ash, and that's been on purpose because archaeologists have said that it's better to leave some in case archaeologists in the future have better archaeological methods. Now, 
The houses of the wealthy were designed around an open patio or atrium. We had all kinds of gardens and frescoes, very beautiful detailed mosaics. Um, in one of the videos, it points has um, it shows an imaginary traveler moving through the streets of Pompeii, and directions were given not by street names, but rather by descriptions of buildings, like you go up go up three streets and then you turn right at the public bath or whatever. But there were signs on the streets at intersections, and those aren't street signs to identify the streets, but rather they're supposed to ward off any evil spirits at the intersections because the belief was that the evil spirits would congregate at the intersections. And, you know, we may say, oh, how superstitious, but today many, many buildings, office buildings or residential buildings have no 13th floor because so many people consider the 13th floor uh, to be superstitious or the number 13. So this is an example of a large home owned by a wealthy person. And you can see this is from the entrance. You can see the entryway. You can see in the back the open atrium with large gardens. This is an example of one of the mosaics. This is near inside, near the front door of a house. This is to let any intruder know that they have a vicious guard dog. Now, this is another example of Roman uh, mosaics. This is not from a private home. This is a public bath, but you can see the intricacy of these mosaics. And perhaps, at least for me, by far the most impressive mosaic is this one that at first glance looks uh, like a painting, but if you see it in person and you get close to it, you can realize that it's a mosaic. There's small pieces of colored stone or glass have been glued together uh, to make this huge mosaic. Uh, it's in the museum in Naples, and it's probably 20 feet wide by 10 or 15 feet high. And standing at a distance, it looks like a painting. As you get there, you can see how carefully crafted it was. And finally, this is another mosaic showing sea life. Uh, you can see the little individual bits of stone here. And why would they do a mosaic with sea life? Well, Italy is a peninsula. Many people worked in the fishing industry and people ate a tremendous amount of fish. But you can just see the detail there. <clears throat> now, the Romans excelled in architecture. In fact, there's an old saying uh, criticizing the Romans, saying, well, the Romans are known for their drains, you know, like the sewer drains, but the Greeks for their brains. Um, do you agree? Well, personally, I don't. I mean, I think engineering is not a mindless skill. This takes a lot of creativity. And in fact, the Roman engineers and architects solved many, many of the problems that uh, had frustrated the Greeks and all the others. As I mentioned earlier, uh, introduction of this lecture, there's a huge, huge road network. This is the network of major highways in the ancient Roman world. You can see it goes all the way from England across Europe into the Middle East and all North Africa. Here you can see, this is obviously a modern photo. This was taken just south of uh, Rome and you can rent bicycles and go along this road. It's rather bumpy. At the time it was built, 2000 years ago, it was perfectly smooth. The structures, by the way, on the right, this is right outside Rome, were graves of very wealthy Romans. Now this is a cross section of the complex construction. Uh, any of you in civ studying civil engineering will appreciate appreciate this. First, you can see on both sides you have ditches. That's for the rainwater to go off. At the bottom, you have sand or dry earth, then crushed rock. And this was all crushed by hand, with hammers or uh, sledgehammers. Then you have gravel in a cement mortar, sand, gravel, and cement. And at the top, you have large stone slabs. 
finish smoothly. And then you can see how it slopes off to the sides for the rain. Now this is 24 feet wide throughout the Roman Empire. And this was the standard Roman military formation. The roads were built. Why? Not for Romans to go on holiday, so that Roman soldiers could move quickly. And so the road was uh, 24 feet wide. Most of the roads were built by Roman soldiers who, when they weren't fighting, had to be kept busy. <clears throat> they constructed 53,000 miles of major highways. But let's compare that to our own interstate highway system, which is only 47,000 miles. Incredible. They also constructed four times as many, or 200,000 miles of secondary roads, and these were all paved. There were 29 major highways radiating from Rome itself. And in the Roman Forum, remember that's right near the Colosseum, they had a golden milestone, the Malarium Arium, and that was the starting point of the Roman road system. And that led to the often quoted uh, statement, all roads lead to Rome. So if you were off in England or Turkey or somewhere else, and they had mileage markers, it would be the mileage from the center of Rome. And the road system was really considered by many as the foundation of defense because they could move their troops quickly by land and also prosperity for trade. Now I mentioned before that Augustus and the, the other early emperors used architecture and public buildings to impress the public with the authority of the emperors. And this has led to a vast legacy in their construction techniques. They invented concrete. Concrete is inexpensive. It can be formed into any shape you want. You build a wooden frame, pour in the concrete, let the concrete harden, take the wood away, and there you have whatever form you want. Concrete's incredibly strong. It's water resistant. It doesn't rot like wood. And it's fireproof. Only extremely high temperatures will uh, damage concrete. And it was also used as a mortar. A mortar, of course, is the cement used to hold bricks or stones together. And that allowed Romans to make the joints as strong as the material itself. And of great significance is, in addition to normal concrete, the Romans invented a waterproof, excuse me, a concrete that could dry under water. Today it's called Portland cement or concrete. And so what they do to build a, a dock out in the, the ocean or a river is they would put the wood out on both sides and then they would pour concrete in. The concrete would push the water out then the concrete would dry even though it was wet and then they'd take the wood away and there you had your concrete dock or harbor. They also developed the arch, the vault, and the dome uh, which are principal engineering achievements. Uh, be sure you read about those in the textbook. And they used their scientific knowledge of stresses and counter stresses just like modern day engineers do. And let's look briefly at the barrel vault and the dome. Oops. Here we have the barrel vault on the left. You can see it's just a series of arches put together. The arrows represent the stresses. The stresses come down and they go into the buttress or the rocks on the side. And then the groin vault is just when you have two barrel vaults at right angles come together. The net result of this was opening up buildings. <clears throat> they were masters of the dome. This is the Pantheon dome. Uh, Pantheon, the church, Pantheon means all gods um, in central Rome. And you can see here in the side view, the dome with the thick, thick walls for the um, the stress to go down. At the top is the oculus, O-C-U-L-U-S, which in Latin literally means eye. 
and they left that open to reduce the weight at the top because you look at the drawing on the right, there's nothing holding up that ceiling. There are no, there are no, no, no beams. And so in an effort to reduce the weight, they opened that up. In addition, it let light in. To this very day, that hole exists there. There's no plexiglass or anything on it. And rain comes in and they have a drain down in the hole. So you could, how did they build the ceiling? Well, let's look there. The dome, they, they lightened the dome. They needed to reduce the weight. This is concrete. And so you see they made these geometric patterns, which had the effect of having thinner or therefore lighter concrete up there. They look nice, and it's called coffering. We still use the same word today. In your house, you may have a coffered, coffered living room ceiling. Also, being the masters of engineering they were, as they put concrete higher and higher in the dome, they put lighter concrete up because it didn't need to support as much weight. And they did that by adding very lightweight volcanic ash to the concrete. Uh, this is a photograph of the Pantheon in Rome. Again, look at the people. See how large this is. It has a classic Greek entrance. You can see the columns there. But then in the back, the marvel is that large circular building, which is the Pantheon with no supports for the roof except the sides. You'll notice the walls of the circular part of the building have very small windows at the top, virtually none, because they needed very, very thick walls at this point to support that heavy dome. Now this will change significantly as we move over the next 1,500 years in this course, and you'll see how eventually uh, they were able to construct walls with very thin columns and largely made of stained glass. But we're not there yet. So this is the inside of the Pantheon. Polished walls, polished, should be polished, yeah, marble, polished marble on the sides. And the light comes in. You clearly see the oculus on the top. You can see the coffered ceiling of the dome. There are no other windows. All the light comes in right there. And this started out as a temple pantheon to all the gods. And then when Rome in the fourth century became Christian, this became a Catholic church. And to this very day, it remains a Catholic church. So all the light came in from the oculus. And that light also symbolizes heaven. It's heavenly light. Uh, and, and light, as we'll see when we talk about Christianity later, is very much uh, perceived in Christianity as coming from heaven. Now again, it was constructed as a temple to all the gods, Pantheon. And it had statues of gods such as Mars, Venus, Julius, Caesar, etc. And it was circular and that was to symbolize order, harmony, and that the harmony between the gods and the Roman people. And as I mentioned later, when the Roman Empire became Christian or uh, before the Reformation, all Christians were Roman Catholics and they had an altar there and a tomb of, of Raphael wanted to be buried there. And the Pantheon is so important in architectural history. It serves as the model for many domes, including the Florence Cathedral, which was built during the Renaissance. We'll see that in the next slide. St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. Thomas Jefferson's home at Monticello, Virginia. And the U.S. Capitol, as well as, of course, the Texas Capitol. This is um, Florence, the cathedral in Florence. And we'll study this later. You can see that dome, which while taller than the Pantheon, was modeled on the uh, Pantheon. And this was 1,500 years later. This is the US Capitol. Right now, let's turn quickly to aqueducts. This is a photo of a well-preserved aqueduct today. 
and this is not even in Italy, this is in France, in southern France, and the aqueduct carried water, fresh water, from higher elevations down to cities. Well, the particular city this aqueduct goes to didn't have a supply of fresh water, so Roman soldiers organized the construction of this aqueduct. The water is actually on the very top there, but they had to make it so large because of this valley with the river and the water flows gently, gently for many miles. It's amazing this is still standing after 2,000 years. <clears throat> the aqueducts were constructed by the emperors to sh show their generosity throughout the empire to the people by providing food, bread when there was a shortage of food or a famine, and providing water, amphitheaters for gladiators, public baths, etc. Now, most aqueducts were underground in stone pipes. Now, the engineers had to look at the source of water, and then they had to look where it was going to a city. And then we all know water flows downhill. They had no pumps, obviously, in those days. So the, the aqueduct itself, the pipe, had to decline only two or three feet per mile. Why? Because they're bringing the water from 20, 30, 40, 50 miles away, and the water supply isn't that much higher. So they had to calculate that exactly, which is absolutely amazing. And this water was used for everything from drinking. Uh, most people didn't have you know, faucets like we have, so they'd have to walk to the street corner with a bucket, and there was a fountain with water coming out all the time. Um, there were other fountains which were more uh, decorative fountains. They had the public baths, which we talked about already, which are free. And private villas or private homes had, you know, used lots of water for their gardens, for their fountains, whatnot. And there were so many aqueducts. There were 19, in fact, just into Rome. It's amazing. And some of those in Rome are still in use today. And very important in, in law was the emperor said the auto aqueducts have automatic right-of-way on private land. What does that mean? You can't say, well, I have a beautiful home here in the outside of Rome, and I don't want you to build this aqueduct with all these arches and towers down my backyard. It ruins the view. Well, the emperor said, sorry. That's what we call in law today eminent domain, and I think that exists in all countries. certainly does in Europe and the U.S. That means the government has the right to take your land for a public use. And obviously in the United States today, they don't build aqueducts across our land. But if someone wants to build a, a highway, the state, the city, the federal government wants to build a highway or uh, airport, and my house is in the way, I must by law leave my house the government must pay me the fair market value of my house before they decided to put a road right through it. Uh, and you know, you can't argue, well, my great granddad lived here. This is part of the heritage. No. And so this is where the public has, uh, the government has the right to put public use over private use. The aqueducts were so highly developed that they had different qualities of water depending on the source. Some of it was used for gardening. People said it didn't really taste well enough to drink. Others for drinking. And they would uh, have water inspectors decide that. <clears throat> now, a real problem would be people trying to take too much water out of the water duct, uh, the aqueduct. Because remember, the water is flowing downhill. So let's say you're right outside of Rome and you have this beautiful house and you have an aqueduct nearby and you want to have beautiful gardens you want to have like a beautiful beautiful swimming pool with water coming in so you just have you do not have the right to go up and put a pipe coming out of that aqueduct and take too much water because if you took too much water the people in the city would have hardly any water so the, the way they did this was quite ingenious they had different diameters of pipes and you had to get permission from the government, and the pipe had um, the government's permission stamped on it. The pipes were made of lead. And so let's say you have your beautiful villa right outside Rome, 
And they would say, okay, Professor Glover, you can use so much water and you can, you must use this pipe. And they would send inspectors out. It's something very, very similar all over the world today. In the state of Texas, there is an office in the state government. I've forgotten the name of it. They look at water use because it's particularly important for farmers. You can't have a farmer that takes, you know, 80% of the water out the river because then there's no water left downstream for other farmers or for uh, other purposes. <clears throat> now, all this water is coming into Rome and other cities. It comes in all the time, 24-7. Um, the fountains are always going. Rome and other cities would have been underwater if they hadn't built a very elaborate drainage system. It's just as elaborate as the aqueducts, but it's underground, and it's to take the water and refuge, sewage from toilets, and returns it to, in the case of Rome, the Tiber River. In fact, the engineering was so advanced in many Roman cities, they had uh, public toilets. You'd go in the toilet. Uh, they didn't have the same sense of privacy we have. They'd have a canal of water, and above it, they'd have seats with holes in them you'd sit in, and there was no privacy barrier, and people would sit there, and uh, their excrement would fall in the water and be flushed down. In fact, many people would go and sit there and have long conversations. So they had not had a boy whose job it was was to move people along if there was a line. Now, the Emperor Augustus, his chief advisor, was speaking for many Romans and certainly for the emperor when he said, with such an array of indispensable structures carrying so many waters, he's referring to the aqueducts, compare, if you will, the idle pyramids or the useless though famous works of the Greeks. So the Romans were very proud of what they built. It was practical, it provided a purpose. They would say, what was the purpose of the pyramids other than the, the Egyptian belief in um, the need for the Pharaoh to go to heaven and the useless works of the Greeks. <clears throat> now let's look a little more detail at the amphitheaters, which were built for gladiatorial contests. That's all they did there. And the animal executions and the executions. Um, the one in Rome is typically referred to as the Colosseum. It's technically the Flavian Colosseum. But everybody, um, and it's named Colosseum because it was, in ancient times, a huge statue of uh, the famous figure Colossus, which no longer exists there. Um, but there are basically amphitheaters in the round. There was free entry. The lower classes would sit near the top. The women would, would go and sit at the very top. They were made of concrete. So the many arches you see are decorative. They are not holding up the building. It's the concretes holding up the building. Uh, they even had in Rome and all the Colosseums around the empire, sunshades we put up. In the case of Rome, they had a thousand Roman soldiers, whose, or sailors rather, whose job it was, was to put up these big poles and they had big sails they had sewn together. And as the sun moved, they would move the poles and the sails so nobody had sun in their eyes. And the design of the Colosseum in Rome, which was the largest, was so impressive that in the event of an emergency, it could be totally emptied in five minutes. And all modern theaters, or big uh, sporting events theaters, use exactly the same ramp system. This is what you see today in Rome. Um, you only see about a third of the Colosseum because much of it was destroyed. Uh, people went to steal the, the marble off the side uh, to build other buildings. But it's a huge, again, you can see people. If you look closely, they're just above the grass. You can see people standing there. Uh, you can see, okay, those people six feet high, six feet tall. Look at how big that Colosseum is. It's huge. This is an interior view of the Colosseum today. You can see the seats. Um, you can see, again, for the scale, look over on the right, the, the tourists standing there. 
And near where the tourists are, they have some very well-preserved marble seats, which were for the emperor and others. <coughs> now the walkway you see in the middle is the ground level. And that was totally covered. And that was covered with sand because of all the blood. And what you see underneath was a very complex area for the shows. And these were shows. So underneath you had the gladiators who were waiting to go out and you had the animals. And you also had elevators because people didn't just walk in the side like in the movies. They had 32 elevators that could operate simultaneously. And they were operated by slaves pulling ropes. And that would open a, a, a trap door, like in the sand. It would open up and out would pop a gladiator or a lion. And what the crowd loved was having three or four gladiators out there. And then all of a sudden, 32 different animals pop up all over the Colosseum floor and the gladiators have to run around and uh, uh, deal with so many animals. Uh, and that was very, very spectacular. Now, in the late imperial period, as the government was losing its authority, Romans themselves went and stole the marble off the front because it was very valuable. <clears throat> okay, we just talked about this, the area for animals. Uh, in fact, one of the church popes uh, Pope Alexander VI in the 1400s, he even claimed that he as the Pope controlled the Colosseum and he leased it so people could go in and as a quarry for marble, people had to pay money and they were allowed to go in and take all the marble they wanted. Well, that ended about 200 years later in 1744 when another Pope, Benedict XIV, stopped the removal of the stone and on the grounds that this is a sacred area for the Catholic Church, for the Christians, because this is an area where Christian martyrs died. Rather than give up their faith, they were martyrs because they died. And you can go there today and you can still see a cross uh, near the center of it that Pope uh, Benedict had erected in uh, the 1700s. And the Colosseum has long been a symbol of Rome. In fact, the famous British poet, poet Lord Byron uh, said a couple hundred years ago, while stands the Colosseum, Rome shall stand. When falls the Colosseum, Rome shall fall. And when Rome falls, the world. <clears throat> well, let's watch the fall of Rome. This is the decline now of the Roman Empire. The Emperor Constantine uh, in uh, the year, the fourth century, in the 300s, had moved part of the capital from Rome to the new city of Constantinople, what's now Istanbul in Turkey. And this was well before the empire fell. He did that because he liked the climate better, he liked the agriculture better. Um, and that's where the Roman em Empire, after it fell in Italy, ended up going. The empire didn't fall overnight. It wasn't destroyed overnight by an invading army. Now, why did the Roman Empire decline? After about 1,000 years of the Republican Empire, what happened? Well, historians disagree somewhat on the causes. There's some significant causes. Um, one thing that's important to remember is the Romans, just like the Egyptians, had a static view of of their empire. They thought they had created the perfect world, the perfect empire, and they thought it would never end. Well, it did. <clears throat> as we saw previously, the army had greatly increased power because as they had foreign military conquests, they gained lots of possessions. And so many of the generals were not from Italy, but rather from other areas in the Roman Empire. So they didn't have the same traditional faith in you know, the Italian-based Roman Empire. The army helped choose the emperor, and many emperors weren't even Roman in the sense that they weren't from Italy. There were external threats, <coughs> so-called barbarian tribes. Barbarian 
were people that they called barbarians. They looked down upon because they felt, you know, they couldn't speak properly. All they would say is blah, 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 blah. So they called them barbarians. Particularly the Huns and the Goths ended up attacking uh, Rome. Some provinces broke off, started their own armies. Well, this decreased trade and taxes went up. A very significant factor was climate change. There's a lot of talk nowadays about climate change. Well, there's been climate change in various periods of history for a long time. In the fourth century, there was what was called a mini ice age north of the Alps. So in what's now France and Germany, that whole area. And mini ice age, those countries weren't covered with ice all year round, but the, the climate got significantly cooler. And when the climate... And when the economy is based on agriculture, that's significant because that reduces the length of the growing season so they had fewer crops. And that led many of those people to invade warmer land in order to farm. And of course, the people who took over the Roman Empire were from Northern Europe. Also, at the same time, another factor was you had epidemics in Egypt. Now, it's important to realize Egypt the area around, remember when we studied uh, Egypt, in northern Egypt, when the Nile River spreads out into the Delta, very wealthy agricultural land. And that's where the Roman Empire received most of its wheat throughout the empire. It was exported from Egypt throughout the empire. Well, there was an epidemic there. And the slaves who produced the food Many, many of them died of the diseases, and so you had a crop failure. And this led to large amount of hunger in many cities throughout the Roman Empire. And traditionally, people who had been loyal to the emperor because it provided free food when needed, and now there was no food to give the people. Well, during the actual invasion itself of Rome, it was fairly easy to take over a city like Rome because the barbarians, whom the Romans looked down upon as you know, they couldn't even speak Latin, well, they did what was obviously the best way. They cut the aqueducts. So you have Rome, for instance, with 19 aqueducts coming in, providing all the fresh water. What do you do? You just go, you don't have to destroy miles of aqueducts. You destroy five feet of an aqueduct. The water's coming down and it just spills in the ground, it never gets to Rome, and uh, they couldn't last very long without water. <clears throat> Another theory, which was very popular a number of years ago now, people question whether it's really, really the reason, but it could be a contributing factor, was lead poisoning. Um, lead was a very common mineral it was used often uh, in the ancient world. It's very soft. It's found in lots of places. It's easy to, to uh, melt and shape. <clears throat> and the Romans used lead pipes in plumbing. You can go to Pompeii today and you can see the lead pipes. The aqueducts were lined with lead. The wealthier people all ate off of lead plates. And even more serious is they use lead cooking vessels. And for instance, many of their uh, wines, they took, uh, they took um, the wine as part of the process and they boiled it in lead pots. And so the boiling, the high temperature, the lead leached out and went into the, into the wine. Scientists have reconstructed those wines and it has something like 10,000 times the the U.S. limit for lead uh, in each glass of wine. Well, the net effect was they looked at the bones of some uh, Romans and they found there were increased lead levels. Now, lead we know today, and the Romans even knew this, it causes learning disabilities, mental retardation, and death. And there was a big scandal in the United States in the 1960s and 70s when doctors went out to try and see why children in poor areas in like New York City 
were doing so poorly in school, they couldn't concentrate or anything. So they went in their homes and they found they lived in apartments <coughs> that were not well taken care of. Uh, people were renting them and bits of paint were coming off the wall. And of course that paint had lead in it and little children, as they always do, they were crawling around, little toddlers, they put everything in their mouth and they started checking the blood of these children and they found, lo and behold, they had extremely high levels of lead and they uh, did some sort of treatment to reduce the lead level and the children did better in school. Well, that led in 1978 to a law throughout the United States that is prohibited to use lead in paint that's used in a house or an apartment. Now, if you go out or your family and you buy a home that was made in the before 1978 or built, you will be required by law to sign a statement that you realize the house was built before 1978. It might have lead on the walls and you are encouraged to go get an independent inspector to come out and check the paint. Uh, lead was used in gasoline from the 1920s until it was prohibited in the United States in 1991. <coughs> lead was put in gasoline because it somehow helped lubricate the um, internal combustion engine. You know, the pistons go up and down the cylinder and somehow having the lead in the gasoline when there's that explosion with the spark plug, it, it uh, improved the uh, efficiency of the engine. Well, because of the concern about lead, and particularly for children whose brains are developing their neurological system, uh, there has been no lead permitted in gasoline in the United States for almost 30 years. Now that's interesting because you go to many gas stations and it still says on the pump unleaded. Uh, some now say regular or super, but uh, whenever I go to Costco, they have a big sign up and the price is unleaded or premium gasoline. Well, it's sort of ridiculous because there hasn't been any unleaded gasoline in the United States for almost 30 years. Okay, back to ancient Rome. Well, you had this series of invasions, and ultimately, in the year 476, uh, you can round it off to 500, the last Roman emperor in Italy was deposed. The um, emperor moved from Rome, and you can read in the textbook, up north uh, near Venice to Ravenna. But then, for the next 100 years, until 1453, the city of Constantinople, now known as Istanbul, continued the Roman Empire. And you had the Byzantine emperors there until 1453 when Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Empire. So what that means is, and that was called the, the Eastern Roman Empire or typically called the Byzantium Empire. We'll talk a lot about that. We have a whole lecture on that later. So what that meant was the Roman Empire lasted for almost 2,000 years. <clears throat> then the spirit of Rome was reborn in the Renaissance, which took place uh, largely in, in Italy. And we'll, we'll spend the last couple of weeks of the course talking about the Renaissance. Renaissance is a French word that means rebirth. In Spanish, it's called Renacimiento. And it's the rebirth of what? It's the rebirth of the wisdom of ancient Greece and Rome. So we'll go full circle and see the Roman Empire sort of resurrected in principle uh, along with the Greeks during the Renaissance. Okay, thank you very much.